Hello friends, welcome to Soulful Spinning. This is my channel on YouTube where I share my creative endeavors with the fiber arts, mainly knitting and spinning and wool preparation. So all things woolly you will find here on my channel. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for uh, coming back. And if you're a new viewer, thanks so much for checking me out. So I see we've gotten quite a lot of new subscribers over the last uh, couple of weeks. This last, uh, I think about eight weeks we've been doing this breed study and I have broke the 10,000 mark. So uh, at the conclusion of the breed study, which is after next week, we've got one more breed. Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, sometime before the holidays, I picked up a breed sampler from Hearthside Fibers of just different breeds from around the world. Most of them were comb top preparation, but there were a couple of rovings in there. It was a uh, 12 box, 12 sample box, and I think I threw in Black Welsh Mountain as a baker's dozen. So we are on our penultimate breed this week. Uh, we're we're going to talk about Rambouillet. Uh, Rambouillet is the way that Americans say the breed, and it is a very, very common breed that's uh, raised in the western U.S. I read just this morning that two-thirds of the western ranges have Rambouillets. And the shepherds and farmers are out there are going to say Rambouillet. They're not going to say Rambouillet, Rambouillet. I can't even say it in the correct French pronunciation. Today is the 17th of March. It's St. Patrick's Day. I do have um, my only green shirt that I own. I put it on today and I switched out my, uh, my background too to, uh, to this shawl that I made some time ago. I don't remember what the pattern is, but I thought it was appropriate for St. Patrick's Day that I, uh, that I take out something green. So yeah, I have this draped over my, my chair here. So yeah, so in today's episode, we're gonna talk about Rambouillet, its origins, its characteristics, a little bit of its history, and then my experience spinning the uh, little sample I have and uh, my progress with my square. So I've been taking my 25-ish grams every week and spindle spinning them and then I'm making a square. Um, all of my squares are from the Berlin Blanket by Kate Davies, but one, which I kind of went off, off the path there and I picked up a, pick a different stitch pattern. I have an update on my socks that I've been working on on a commercial yarn. I have a swatch cap I'm working on for a hand spun uh, jumper that I want to make. I have some fleece preparation, uh, not, not from fleece, but I've been playing around with my hackle. I have a major craft hackle and I took some sort of compacted braids and actually I took a Rambouillet braid from my stash and I made some beautiful comb nests uh, with some silk and fancy add-ins that I want to show you. My book from my bookshelf this week will be a book I picked up from um, my local craft store. It's on Japanese lace stitches, which is such a beautiful, beautiful book. Yeah, and then just talk about a little bit about future plans. So here's some information I found out about Rambouillet from the web. And this is from a website called RaisingSheep.net. And from this website, we learned that the Rambouillet is a noble looking breed originally coming from France and was the product of breeding local stock with Spanish Merino. So Spain had the, the market on fine wools at one point, and they guarded it very, very jealously. And indeed, exporting sheep from Spain at, uh, for many, many a time uh, could result in a severe penalty and even death. But because, you know, all the European royalties were all related, um, I guess the Spanish Merino were gifted to various other countries. and. So the Spanish Merino that came into northern France at the estate of Louis XVI, I believe, in Rambouillet, Rambouillet, Rambouillet. I was trying to find the right pronunciation. <laughs> I, I'm doing my best there. But in uh, Rambouillet, France is where the original breed started in the 18th century. It's the most common breed of the U.S. Western area sheep flocks and founds, uh, forms the foundation of the U.S. sheep industry. It's distinguishable by its white face and its woolly legs, and it's a leading breed in the fine wool category. 
so I guess Rambolets can thrive in a variety of conditions. So they do well on harsh, veg ve harsh vegetation and, and poorer climates. They have a strong natural instinct to stay uh, together as a group. A strong flocking instinct, which, which helps them uh, protect them from predators. I read that about Targi as well. <clears throat> so that's definitely a positive thing to have if you're raising sheep out, out on the range. <clears throat> they have a long breeding period, and they're uh, used as a common core for crossbred flocks. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a fleece uh, upstairs, and I think it's a, um, it's a BFL cross, and I think the shepherd said it was BFL cross with Rambo, which is abbreviation for Rambo A. So it's valued for its outstanding wool production and high quality fine wool fleeces. The rams have impressive horns that can really spiral around and curl. And the ewes are typically polled, which means they don't have horns. The rams are big, they're 200 to 300 pounds, and the ewes are 140 to 180 pounds. Uh, the average micron is 19 to 24. Its grease fleece weight is 10 to 15 pounds for use, quite a large fleece. I think at one point I was on the fleece selling uh, website uh, on Facebook, and I think I, I saw a Rambole for sale, but it was like 10 pounds. It was just this enormous fleece. And so, yeah, I'm not, for a home processor, I don't think that's really that practical in, in my case. Uh, maybe a small quantity of, of raw rambouille I would, I would bring into the house and, and process, but yeah, I think that with uh, I, what I've learned over these uh, last couple of breeds that I've been moving more into the fine wools is that the fine wools are a lot harder to process at home. It, it's, it's more difficult to get all, most of the grease out. And if you don't get all the grease out or if you let the water cool as it's washing, it can redeposit, get sticky and hard to get off. So I, you know, I think that going with a commercial preparation for some of the finer wools might, might be actually be a good idea in some cases just because of the difficulty in home processing, you know, as opposed to like a Shetland or a Jacob or a Finn, something that's, or Romney that's lower grease and more open, easier to process. Uh, what else? Uh, the yield is 45 to 55 percent, which I think is pretty typical of a high grease fine wool. The staple length is two and a quarter to four inches, and it's good for both meat and wool. And from the Peace Fleece website, so Peace Fleece is a company, I don't think they're selling yarn anymore, but Peace Fleece, um, sort of environmentally and culturally sensitive uh, company, and they have, uh, on their website, they talk a little bit about the history. Uh, from there, I learned that it gets its name from the Ram Rambouillet state, state in northern France. So in 1786, Louis XVI imported 360 Spanish Merinos. And through selective breeding, Rambos appeared crossing with English long wool breeds, which is a theme that comes up time and time again with a lot of the, a lot of the wools. So Polworth had, had a, was a cross, a Corridale, Bond, uh, Targi, they're all uh, crosses with fine wools and then long wools and then they're bred back to the fine wool micron. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the nice soft fleece, but then you also get the longer staple length. They're very hardy. Um, they can thrive in harsh conditions with sparse vegetation, which I mentioned. So in comparing the crimp with other fine wools, um, the website said that the crimp is more disorganized, it has more length and more warmth, and hence added strength, which bumps uh, slightly out of the super fine range. I imagine you can find super fine uh, rambolets, but usually they're fine, but they're on the lower end of fine. Uh, from uh, Britannica.com, uh, I learned that the Rambolets prevail on western ranges, where two-thirds of sheep are U.S. Uh, sheep of the United States are produced. They're the largest of the fine wool breeds. And then again, uh, piggybacking on what I said before, use our crossbred extensively with medium coarse long wools, rams, to produce choice market lambs and rugged breeding ewes with heavy, attractive medium wool. So that's a lot. I, I think that I'll the uh, Rambouillet and Rambouillet crosses are used quite extensively in uh, the American wool uh, market, both lamb and wool. 
So, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, you know, to learn about the different breeds and their origins. And this is a pretty, uh, pretty prevalent breed here. So I, I wouldn't spend a ton of money on a Rambouillet fleece. I think um, if I decide to work with it again, I probably will get um, already prepared roving or top just because it's that, it's that real fine wool and it'd be a lot of work to get it. Well, never say never, but I actually have a Rambouillet braid here that I dug out of my stash from many years ago. Uh, this is a this is a braid from Corgi Hill Farm, and this one this is called Seattle Sky. And it's been in a plastic bin for a long time. You can see it's quite uh, it's braided up. It's very beautiful. And what I'm doing with this, instead of spinning it on its own, I'm using this on my hackle and I'm creating some beautiful blended top, which I'll show you just here in a minute. But let's go back to um, the, my spinning of the wool and my swatch, and then we'll move on to the next, next segments. So I started the spin on two spindles here. And these are two very similar spindles. The, this one is U wood, which is made from Enid Ashcroft. And this one is Texas jeans. I think it's a spalted tamarind or something. And I selected these two because of their similar, um, they have a similar hook. You can see that. So get out of my. And they have a similar weight. So I started spinning the wool with these spindles. And I have some spindle spun samples, but I, I didn't, I cheated kind of, you guys. I, I went to my wheel to spin most of the fiber because I was getting bored and I was, the fiber really wanted to spin thin because it's fine. And I just didn't have the time this week or the patience to get it all done on my spindles, but I do have some spindle spun yarn here. And these are my two little babies. <laughs> They're two little mini mini skeins that I made. Uh, there's two of them because the yarn broke and I just decided to do it into two. Beautiful spindles. And then I also spun some on my little mini tiny, teeny tiny Turk by uh, Ian Tate. And here you can see how thin it is. Uh, this is lace weight yarn on this little spindle. So I think fine, fine wool, just by its very nature, uh, is easier to spin thin. It is e for easy for me to spin thin. I'll insert some video here of me spinning this wool on my uh, double treadle lendrum.
And I used uh, sort of a modified worsted draw kind of around the bend. I think I learned this watching Margaret Stove uh, spin super fine merino. And I spun up enough, I think I've got plenty to finish my square. Here's my square in progress. Well, that's, that's the wind. Here's the ball. I, I didn't do a grist measurement, but I, I know that it's fingering weight yarn. And it's going to be many, many yards per pound because it's a very, uh, it's a very light fiber. Um, comparing this with the Polworth, I feel, oh, I finished my Polworth square last week. I didn't show you my completed Polworth. So this is the Polworth from last week. And I just found that the Polworth has a much more elegant hand. It's a little bit brighter white, and it's just a little bit more delicate, probably a little bit finer micron. I found the Rambouillet to be very uh, robust, but soft. And I think it would be really beautiful in really any application, um, from accessories to sweaters. Though I think with sweaters, you'd want to make sure that you have enough ply twist to keep the integrity of the yarn. It would probably pill as all fine wools will do along abrasive areas. I think also that it would be great blending. So I'm blending it now with the colored braid with some silk and it's, it's really changed the character a little bit. It's been a lot, lot more fun to spin. So I think Rambouillet mixed up with uh, alpaca or angora, uh, silk, bamboo uh, would make a lovely yarn. It, doesn't have any luster. It's got a very matte finish. Uh, it had a fair amount of, of bounce. So after I washed it, 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 it the hank shrunk up a little bit. And it's very stretchy, but it also has a certain amount of drape that I found as well. So yeah, just a lovely wool all around. I actually did took a deeper dive uh, and I found this webinar online on YouTube and it was sheep goats at Texas A&M Agricultural Extension and they were talking about all about breeding yeah I didn't watch the whole thing it's because not exactly it's very esoteric information but they were talking about that that uh, breeders focus on two qualities multiple lambs and the and fit for the environment. So those are the two things that they, they really uh, strive for in, in breeding sheep. And then they also, of course, want wool quality. And this webinar was all about using data collection to selectively choose ewes and rams to get the you know, more productivity. And they were, it was sort of a sad uh, comment that a lot of the lamb that's uh, consumed in the U.S. is actually from overseas and that the sheep industry has been on, uh, on the decline in the states. I heard the same thing from a viewer from Australia. She said that there used to be sheep everywhere. She, which she, well, there is sheep everywhere, but she goes, she doesn't know where the wool is going. So if it's going overseas to be processed. But um, I'm a big proponent of, of finding wool that's local to you, whether it be in your uh, immediate area or in your country. So, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to be in the States where we just have so many breeds available to us. Of course, I always am so jealous of those English breeds and some of the Norwegian and Scandinavian breeds. So later on, I think I might try to curate some samples of other fibers from other places in the world and continue this breed study. Yeah, so that's, that's everything pretty much about the Rambouillet. I uh, did enjoy it. I enjoyed the spin, like I said, it was a cream color, another cream colored commercial top, and spinning it on the spindles just wasn't really giving me any joy. So I went ahead and, and pulled out my wheel. So let me show you what I did. 
how I converted this braid, which is beautiful in and of itself, into these. So I made, let's see if I get this on the focus here. I made these on my Major Craft Hackle. Yeah, I'm spinning up one here. This is the first one I made, and I didn't use uh, that many add-ins for this one. Um, but as I'm going, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting with, with quantities. So th this, this is just giving me a lot of joy, um, pulling it off of the, of the hackle. If I have time this afternoon when I'm finished here at my desk, uh, I want to go back into my laundry room slash studio and I'll make another uh, pull top and I'll show you how I'm doing that.
I was hoping to have my sock completed this week, but it's been kind of a busy week and I had a lot of irons in the fire and uh, if you know me by now, you know I'm easily distracted. So here's my sock. It's a sock. I am just ready to start the decreases for the toe. And yes, it is this big. I have, uh, I have women's US 10, which is a Euro 42, I think. So I have a pretty, pretty big feet, I'm fairly tall. And so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty large uh, sock, but I did the two by two rib here. And then I did seven inches for the cuff and I did the heel flap and gusset. Now I'm down to the, uh, the middle of my pinky toe. I read somewhere that's uh, for your socks before you start the decreases, you could go to the middle of your pinky toe and then start the decreases. So I don't want to have a lot of excess fabric at the tip of the toe. So this afternoon I hope to, um, I hope to get this, but a very pretty color. Um, somebody said that it reminded them of Van Gogh, you know, starry, starry night. It's got the blues and the darks there. So making good progress on that is my television knitting. Uh, my husband and I are binge watching all the Vera uh, episodes. We had already watched all the Midsummer murder mysteries, and so uh, we started the uh, Vera. And I love Brenda Blethyn as Vera, and the scenery is just stunning in the north of England there. So I've been knitting on this at night. And then the other thing I've been working on is a swatch cap. So I just wanted to test out the color work for uh, Jennifer Steingass's uh, Arboreal Jumper. So this is the hand spun CVM, 100% CVM. Uh, this is a dark brown black. And then this is a gray. I think I might need, I only have one skein of the gray and I'm doing the cap, so I, I might have to spin some more for the jumper. I'm not, I'm not sure how much it's going to take for the yoke. But what I have is the uh, almost the first leaf pattern completed, but I'm doing it uh, in the jumper. It's like this, right? Um, but I'm j going this way. So I'm going to try to work out the math to do another uh, row of leaves and then incorporate some decreases. Uh, rather than just have one row of the leaf and then just have the rest of it uh, the brown. But yeah, I like the, get a little closer. I really like the pattern. It's really pretty. So yeah, I'm testing it, um, you know, not only for gauge, but just to see if I can follow the chart with ease, just get familiarity with it before I tackle um, the larger project of the, of the sweater. So I've been working on that. What else have I been working on? Well, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, if you've been following me, a couple, uh, I think I talked about Polworth. Yeah, I talked about, I talked about Polworth uh, last episode. And in the process of finding the Polworth fleece that I had in my stash, I found some Rambouillet that had, not some Rambouillet, some Romney that hasn't, hadn't been washed yet. And uh, this, this fleece is, um, here it is. It's a Romney lamb. I think it's a lamb. I bought this from a lady on uh, the Facebook fiber uh, fleece group, which I don't even go to anymore because I don't even want to see what's available. But I bought this fleece. The fleece's name was the, the used name was Baby. And I have to say, a lot of Baby is really, really dirty. So what happened here, let me get up and show you the lock here. So the tips of this fleece are quite muddy. It's a strong fleece. Um, and after I, I did a cold soak, but you could see all the dirty, muddy tips. Um, not all the fleece was this dirty, but um, a lot of it is. And how I'm dealing with this uh, is the follow. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm taking the dirty tip. I'm doing this over a garbage or over a, a, an old towel, 
and I'm flicking the tips here. And I'm getting this. So the tips, you know, this is the butt end here. I'm just flicking the tips. Sometimes there's a little residual dirt left in there, but no big deal. And then I'm uh, combing this with my Valkyrie combs. And let me show you my nest so far. Et voila. These are all the beautiful nests. So this, yeah, so look. Like, isn't it something? This, this turned into this. So beautiful. A lot of the Romney that I've dealt with has a sort of a halo to it, sort of a, you know, the typical sort of long wool characteristic. This Romney has more bounce and has luster, but it doesn't really have much of a halo after you spin with it. And I actually found some, a, a big hank that I made from this wool. And here it is. It's a big, bulky, two-ply yarn, about probably seven or eight wraps per inch, or maybe even fewer. And then I had a second one. I think I did this on a spindle. And then I did this one uh, on my wheel. And it has, I'll show you up close here. So it has a very creamy color. And it has a lot of life, a lot of bounce to it. And uh, for a long wool, it's not too heavy. I spun this from those nests, and I just did a, a very low twist, uh, loose single, and then plied it together. So, yeah, I just love a nice bulky, bulky yarn. So I, I pulled this out because I've been following Tashi, and everybody knows about Tashi right now, right? If you haven't checked out Tashi's channel, um, Stitches and Starlight, go ahead and check her out. She's a ball of energy and enthusiasm for everything fiber related. But she, she posted something in her stories of, uh, showing this cardigan that's made out of, I guess, a new spin cycle yarn. And it's a thick, it's a plump, I think the, it's called spin cycle plump or something. And she says, oh, I think I, I you know, she was look, digging around in her stash. I think she's trying to figure out what she could spin to make that cardigan. And I thought, well, I could make it out of this. The only thing is it's undyed at this point. So I was looking at the pattern. I'll, I'll, I don't remember the name of the pattern off the top of my head, but I'll put a picture right here of the pattern. It's, it's a really clever construction. It's, a, it's like kind of a, almost a jacket cardigan. It's got a nice defined uh, armhole. It's got some nice details around the bottom. There's some curved edges. And of course, it's made out of the, that it looks like um, hand spun because of the way spin cycle spins, dyed in the wool, they dye in the wool and then they spin it. But I found on Ravelry there was a, a somebody made the cardigan doing stripes with solid colors. So I was thinking, wouldn't that be fun to spin this all up and then dye it in different, maybe three or four different shades and then make the cardigan like a striped. And the one that I favorited had a little intarsia heart on the pocket because yes, it has pockets, which makes the cardigan even nicer. So that's kind of dream, uh, dream knitting. I'm just trying to find um, patterns that would suit what I, what I have here. Yes. So, so I made some more yarn with that Romney here. So I find the secret to spinning a, a thick single. If you're on a wheel, you want to have the largest ratio. So you want the wheel to move very slowly. So I think J.C. Bogg said, fast hands, slow feet, large whirl will make a thicker yarn. But I also find that having the right preparation, so a combed, I find that with a combed top, 
especially pulled off your combs, makes, a, it makes it easy to control the amount of fiber that's going into the drafting triangle, which I always struggled with the, I didn't see the triangle, but it's how much, uh, obviously how much fiber you're, you're putting into the wheel. So fast hands, a large, larger drafting triangle, and slower spinning. So if you're trying to make a thick single out of a super fine merino, I think it's gonna be a challenge. And the yarn, unless you partially fold it, which means you like partially felt it a little bit, is not gonna have a lot of durability. So I thought, wouldn't this Romney be perfect for a hard-wearing uh, cardigan with a pocket, which I really could use. Yeah, if you're interested in uh, knowing more about spinning thick, I will, uh, once I get some more fiber prepped, uh, maybe next week I will film my technique at the wheel. As I know a lot of you that are watching our wheel spinners and show you how I get a thicker single. And uh, if you have any tips on how to get thicker singles, um, do make our resources. Uh, please do mention it in the description uh, under the description box in the comments because I get that question sometimes. Oh, I've I've gotten so proficient at spinning. All I can do is spin a two ply or a three ply fingering weight, and so you you sort of you, you get sort of one one track kind of default spinning. All right. So from my bookshelf this week is also a, an acquisition. So I was at my local Michael's craft shop this week and I was actually looking for a scrapbook for my breed study and unfortunately I wasn't able to find uh, a suitable scrapbook at the craft store but I was able to find a book. But um, yeah, somebody suggested Timothy suggested that I make a, a, a scrapbook of all my different breeds. So I picked this up from Amazon, just a plain brown. I'm gonna decorate the front. It's just a plain brown, spiral bound notebook. And I'm gonna, uh, every breed, I'm gonna put in here uh, information about it, maybe a little sample swatch and a little lock. So I wanna get that started sooner rather than later. But. This is what I picked up. So this is called Japanese Lace Stitches. Uh, it's an amazing new resource for knitters. The book is filled with beautiful lace patterns, including leaf mode patterns, diamonds, circles and waves, perennial favorites that can be used in all sorts of projects for sweaters and blankets. 11 basic projects give you a chance to try out some of the patterns right away. So I, I, I think I actually have a Japanese stitch dictionary uh, so yeah, I had to run and go get this. So I picked this book up some time ago, and this is a Japanese stitch pattern book, but it's in Japanese, obviously. But it's all just charted. And this, I found this book to have really, really intricate patterns that um, I don't know, realistically, I don't know if I would ever use. I'm sure there's some ones in here that are a little bit more accessible. But I get the feeling that some of the fancy designers are inspired and are maybe using some of these patterns um, in, their, in their work, you know, the real intricate cables and bobbles and everything. But the book I picked up is The Lace Stitches here. And this book is beautiful. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about it is the colored swatches. Um, they just, they're just very visually, uh, very beautiful to look at. And then the charts, which are quite nice here. And as you can see, a lot of the patterns here are, would not be all that difficult to knit. Uh, and this is the, um, in the table of contents here. Now there it is all in white, isn't it lovely? So, but yeah, it's got a variety of colors. But here is the table of contents. You have uh, flower stitch patterns, leaves, geometric forms, oops, you can't see that, lines and li linear patterns, waves and zigzags and combinations. And then it starts out with some patterns at the beginning. 
Uh, it's got chart. It, it teaches you, it tells you how to read a chart, uh, what the symbols mean, practice patterns. It's, it's, it's very thorough in the introduction. And then it has some nice patterns. So uh, this is a, a leaf pattern scarf. Here's a long cowl in feather and fan. It's just got that beautiful Japanese aesthetic, you know, just very elegant looking. And I thought this pattern here would be beautiful in hand spun right here. So it's sort of a basic triangular shawl pattern that you could probably insert your own pa uh, designs in. Uh, here's, a di uh, here's a scarf on this page. Let's see here, what else is in here? Oh, these are so cute. I want to make these out of hand spun. These are just a little pair of wristers. I think they would be really pretty in sort of a, a Gotland or a, a sort of a fuzzy yarn, a Wensleydale long wool or something like that that would give it a little bit of fuzz to it or even um, a mohair mix. A goat mix would be nice. It would give a little bit of uh, that uh, fuzziness to it. Yeah, it's a short cowl with a zigzag pattern. So, yeah, I picked this up because uh, it just the patterns look very accessible and it's just a beautiful book. Here's a pair of wristers. They're made out of cotton. I think they'd be just really elegant. And, she, of course, she's got this beautiful lavender linen uh, Japanese linen blouse. Yeah, it's got a, quite a bit of number of patterns, striped textured shawl, and then a mohair shawl here. So, I mean, for the price of the book alone, um, those patterns are, are really nice and very accessible, I think. So she's got how to work, and then the back, it's how to work all the stitches. So it's got directions with very clear diagrams on how to do all the stitches. So I think I was talking about Barbara Walker's stitch pattern book a couple weeks ago, and I really enjoy perusing that. But I really like the uh, chart format. And so this is sort of a modern take. I actually wanted to do this one for this week's swatch, but I figured I'd stick with the Berlin blanket. Yeah, some of these patterns I've seen in other stitch dictionaries before, but uh, I like the way it's laid out, and I love the, this is the leaf section. They're all in gr different shades of green. For <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day. So the book, I think I, I don't know what the book's price. It was not, let's see. I think it's on uh, here, and you can get it on Amazon for about $16. And I thought it was a worthy addition to my library. And it's also just inspirational just to look at it. And, you know, maybe if you have a little bit of hand spun, you could just make a lace swatch just for fun. All right, I think I've been talking for quite a while now. So, so what's upcoming? Um, a follow-up on my Gossamer shawl book that I talked about in a previous episode. I found some Pygora uh, some Pygora uh, roving or cloud from my stash this week. Pygora is, a, uh, I'm going to do an episode on, about goats, but Pygora is a, is a cross between a pygmy goat and an angora goat. And this is just a cloud of fiber. It's really, really soft. It's dehaired. And I've been playing around trying to spin thin on this beauty here. This is a this is a Spanish peacock. The only thing about this Spanish peacock, and I was kind of disappointed when I received it, it has a little, uh, can you see that little mark there? Like when it was on the lathe, excuse me, when it was on the lathe, I think it got scratched, maybe it didn't get noticed when it was sent out. I mean, it's no big deal because it's a beautiful spindle. But um, look at it go. And so I'm spinning this Pygora up on this spindle. I'm trying to go really thin, but uh, not being that successful. 
but the gossamer shawls are usually knit with um, Orenburg down, which Orenburg goat is a specific kind of goat. And it's hard to come by that fi uh, fiber here. I, I found somebody on Etsy that has it, but uh, I thought, well, what would be a good, you know, domestic source of something similar? So I thought Pygora would, would be an option. Uh, this Pygora is kind of a tan color. So I'm going to try to get my hands on some white. And then I'm going to ply it with a commercial silk thread and uh, see what kind of yarn I get. So I don't have it with me here, but I have started the little uh, sample shawl that was shown in the Gossamer Shawls book. I've just got the, the edging done out of, I'm using some Shetland lace that I have, but I'll show that to you next week when it's completed. So yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is a little bit less than an ounce. Look how much there is. And I was really happy that it hasn't been felted in my stash because it's been in this little bag for a while. So that's future, future projects. Um, definitely going to do a goat study uh, down the line. Yeah, so that's it for, for us this week. Uh, I actually literally thought that I had nothing to talk about this week. <laughs> My husband goes, oh no, honey, you got plenty to talk about. Next week is Merino. I have a, a really pretty sample of the gray Merino from the fiber box. It's the last sample in the box. And I'm thinking hard about how I want to spin that. Um, I've been, I, I, I don't know if I should do sports spindles. I, I'll have to decide, but that's for next week. We'll talk about Merino, which is the last of the breed and will actually be well into spring by then. So the winter breed study will come to a close. But that doesn't ma mean that I'm not going to be continuing to make videos. So I hope to continue my weekly vlog here on whatever it is uh, that I'm working on and, and continue to incorporate different uh, breeds into my episodes and, you know, all the segments that you've been enjoying, I will continue to do. So I hope you're well. I hope you had, had a good week and I hope this coming week is a good one for you as well. I hope you're safe and you're doing well and you're staying healthy. So until next week, friends, have a happy St. Patrick's Day and have a wonderful week. And we'll see you next weekend. Take care, everybody, and bye for now.